Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. Uh, John 17, 17, Jesus says, Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. He also says in John 8, 31 and 8, 32, If you abide in me and abide in my word, then truly you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So that's why I'm going to give you straight scripture, no sugar here, not human opinion that's going to send you in 20 different directions without having any kind of solid foundation underneath so you have any firm footing. I mean, if, it, if, uh, if you listen to all things, to all people, then how are you going to have any firm uh, direction or course of action? That's why here you're just going to get straight scripture, no sugar. So today's topic is emotional errors, emotional errors, and that's something that is uh, prevalent, widespread throughout the world in every uh, culture, every race, every creed commits these emotional errors. And uh, you always hear people say, I'm going to just follow my own heart, or I'm going to do what I think is right, or this is what I'm feeling, so this is the truth. Um, I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing. Well, is that is that correct? Is that right? You know, I'm going to follow my own heart. This is what my heart is telling me, so this is what I'm going to do. Well, if your heart is telling you to murder somebody, does that mean you shouldn't murder somebody? Uh, no. If your heart is telling you you're having some warm and fuzzy feelings about somebody because you're in a good mood and everything's going right for you, that uh, you should follow those feelings? Are those necessarily true? What happens when something goes wrong and you're in a bad mood? Do your, do your feelings about that other person change? Typically they do if you run your life by your emotions because the emotions that we have, although they are given to us by God, they are in fact fallen. And this goes way back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3. Uh, the original sin of Adam and Eve caused all of creation and all of humanity to fall into a state of rebellion against God, to fall into a state of corruption that needed to be redeemed by Christ. And our emotions, although they are given to us by God, they need to be aligned with the truth of God so that our emotions are something that are reliable and dependable and true and not things that can mislead us. And let's see how the emotions mislead us according to the Word of God. So here I'm going to go to scripture from the prophet Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's Jeremiah 17.9. Okay, the heart is deceit, deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So the heart deceives us according to scripture. Interesting. Okay, so that means when you have certain feelings or certain emotions... They aren't necessarily right. Sometimes, in fact, they're wrong and dangerously so. So I'm going to talk about emotional error and the way the heart misleads us in three specific areas. And the first area I'm going to talk about is sexual attraction and how the heart can mislead us in quote-unquote affairs of the heart or attraction for the opposite sex. So here I'm going to go to Proverbs 31 first. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Proverbs 31.30 Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Okay, so you could think if, for example, you're a man and you're attracted to a woman, she may be charming, she may be affectionate, um, she may be very, very attractive, and that's what draws you to her. And you might think, wow, you know, this person is is really something that I'm interested in because she's charming and she's beautiful, but that, you know, basically what that saying, beauty is vain, is you can't judge a book by its cover. Beauty is vain. Now, does that mean that, that God hates beauty? No, God created the beauty. God creates beauty in the universe and everything, not just in members of the opposite sex, but in the stars and the planets and the constellations and nature and and so many things that are just, you know, you can't even count how many beautiful things God creates in the world. So that doesn't mean beauty is worthless in that context. And scripture is all about discernment, right? Um, in that context, it means you can't judge a book by its cover. You know, people who are typically beautiful 
um, what happens is their heart is typically full of vanity and pride because they get a lot of attention uh, just because of the way that they look and it puffs up their pride and they think they're great and they're arrogant you know so typically when somebody for example a woman uh, might you might get the idea that she's attracted to you because she's beautiful and she charms you but in fact she's trying to use you for her own advantage or she's trying she wants to be associated with you in some way or she's flirtatious she just has a superficial passing interest that has absolutely nothing to do with your character or your nature or who you are it's just something that amuses her and entertains her in the moment and doesn't show anything about her character or her true nature charm is deceitful and beauty is vain okay let's go to another one that talks about uh, the deceitfulness of um, of attraction and how you can be deceived into attraction and, and fall into emotional errors uh, for the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil but in the end she is bitter as wormwood sharp as a two-edged sword Proverbs 5 verses 3 to 4 the lips of an immoral woman drip honey what does that mean well women will flatter you attractive women will flatter to get their way to get what they want you know and you might think wow she's really attracted to me wow she really understands me and she sees my intelligence or she sees my creativity or she sees my strength or she sees my insight or my per perception and she's attracted to that it's like no you know they want something from you the lips of an immoral woman drip honey right so she's going to tell you what you want to hear flatter you to get her way you know it might be for any number of reasons it could be just flirtation she's just interested in you because you entertain her in the moment and nothing more than that or maybe you're wealthy and powerful she wants the wealth and she wants the power or maybe you have a lot of influence she wants the influence she wants the power it has absolutely nothing to do with her having some sort of deeper understanding of of who you are or her admiring or respecting what you're about she's just flattering you to get her way or get what she wants right beauty is vain again you know you know you can't judge a book by its cover but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised you know so the back end of that uh, scripture basically means if a woman truly fears God then her mind will be aligned with the truth and she will not be a flatterer she will not be a, a manipulator she will not try to, to cajole or cajole or manipulate you to get her way so you know you have to be aware of that the heart is a deceiver just because somebody is you know a woman or anybody for that matter flatters you or is attractive um, <clears throat> charm is deceitful and beauty is vain right you just have to be be aware of that you might think that they genuinely are attracted to you and they genuinely haven't since have a sincere affection for you but they don't they don't you know don't let your heart deceive you um, so the other issue I want to talk about with the deceitfulness of heart or emotional error is money obviously this is something replete in scripture about how money deceives and how money misleads and how money makes you think okay I'm gonna be fulfilled and satisfied if I have X amount of dollars well guess what you're just gonna want more um, if you make fifty thousand dollars a year you know if money's what you're about you're gonna to want to make a hundred thousand if you make a hundred thousand you're gonna to want to make two hundred thousand you make two hundred thousand you're gonna to want to make four hundred thousand it's a bottomless pit only God satisfies and that is very very conclusive in the book of Ecclesiastes um, where King Solomon the man who had it all and even more had an annual income of 25 tons of gold could never receive any satisfaction from all that gold and I'm gonna to go to a verse uh, from him right here, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5. He who loves money will only want more. He who chases after wealth will never be satisfied with his income. Ecclesiastes 5.10. Okay, it's a bottomless pit. It's a bottomless pit. It's just nothing ever satisfies except God, and only accepting Christ as your son will give you, or Christ as your master or Lord, will give you the indwelling Holy Spirit which will give you peace, love, joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, Galatians 5.22. That only comes with a relationship with Christ where you receive the indwelling Holy Spirit and you receive that peace, that satisfaction, that rest. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him.
right? Turn from wrath and anger. Do not fret. It leads only to evil, right? So that's Psalm 34. Um, or I'm sorry, that's Psalm 37. The point is only God gives you peace. Money does not. It's a bottomless pit. Um, so let's see what else. And there are many, many examples about the emptiness of money and how it deceives you and makes you think you're going to be satisfied, but it never does satisfy you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go to Matthew 13 here. This is the parable of the soils, what Jesus basically describes about um, how the emptiness of worldly pursuits never fulfills only a relationship with God by receiving God's seed or His Word and accepting Christ as Lord. Do you find this peace? So here's Matthew 13. Uh, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the Word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Okay, so this is somebody who hears the word, and he receives it, but he's too preoccupied with the things of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Choke it out, and he becomes unfruitful. Okay, so he starts chasing after money. He starts chasing after materialism. He starts chasing after pleasures, but I want to focus on the deceitfulness of riches. So this idea that if I have more and more and more money, that's going to satisfy me and fill the emptiness inside my heart, or it's going to build a hedge around me and I'm going to be safe against any kind of disaster that befalls the world. And the answer is, you know, it doesn't. It never does satisfy you. And more, more than that is what Jesus talks about in Matthew 13 here, is that people become unfruitful. You know, you get distracted with your preoccupation with money. Now, not only will that not satisfy you, but it makes you unfruitful. In other words, you're not productive for God's kingdom. You know, what does it say in Ephesians 4? That God appointed some of us to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, pastors, and teachers, so that we will come to the unity of the faith. We get equipped for the service of the ministry, so we will come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. So we all have a purpose to serve and to honor God. For some of us, it's pastoring for some of us it's evangelizing for some of us it's teaching you know we all have a role in the kingdom and we need to be serving and to worshiping and to be honoring God but if we get preoccupied with money then not only do we not uh, have any fulfillment or satisfaction but we don't do anything that's fruitful we don't do anything that has eternal value and that is lasting um, so here's the other you know, verse about the deceitfulness of money that that a lot of people know, which is the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, that's First Timothy six ten. You know, not only that does it deceive you and not satisfy you, but it, it makes you um, it makes you evil. It makes you morally bankrupt. You know, so let's go to the fullness of that verse. It actually is First Timothy six verses nine to ten. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. First Timothy, uh, First Timothy 6 verses 9 to 10. The love of money is a root of all forms of evil. All forms of evil. People lie. People cheat. People steal. People cajole, people manipulate, people you know, don't, don't pay their taxes, refuse to pay their taxes, people cheat others to get more and more and more. You know, it's, it's this bottomless pit and you see the greed of the human heart just takes over and then it just gets worse and worse and worse and it leads people into perdition, it says. Perdition is hell. You know, it's never enough. Too much won't be enough. I actually did another sermon on that too much won't be enough and that directly pertains to money i mean solomon the man who had an annual income of in exceeding 25 tons of gold which is 50,000 pounds of gold alone and there was more money as well it talks about that in first kings what did he determine uh, ecclesiastes 114 uh, 114 i have seen everything that is done under the sun and what have i determined all is vanity and a striving after wind. Okay? Now, does that mean everything's worthless and life is pointless? No. 
He didn't put God first, and he comes to the right conclusion in the end. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the end of the matter, or, or in other words, what have I learned? Fear God, obey his commands. This is the responsibility of every person. In other words, if God isn't the focal point of your life, everything else doesn't have any meaning, and it deceives you. It deceives you, and money is one of the greatest deceivers in the that the world has. Um, so the other matter of deception or emotional error I want to talk about is they can happen in relation to family ties. You know, in other words, you could be very close to a family member, and because of that emotional tie, you overlook transgression. And now, you know, Scripture also says, you know, Peter talks about this love covers a multitude of sins. That's true, but it doesn't mean you overlook it. You know, it means you deal with it and you confront it and then you let it go. But basically, you can be so attached to somebody emotionally that you overlook corrupt behavior, you overlook rebellion, you overlook sin, you overlook things that can not only destroy your family, but destroy nations. And I'm actually going to talk about, uh, you know, David, uh, King David, and this is in uh, 2 Samuel 19. I'm going to talk about an example of how his emotions got the better of him and not only threatened his family, but threatened the entire kingdom of Israel when it was at its golden age, when he was basically king. But this is a point where he um, almost lost his kingship uh, to a rebellious son, and that rebellious son is Absalom. His emotions were so wound up in Absalom that he basically was mourning and crying for Absalom when he was threatening to overthrow his own father. Overthrow his own father, destroy the kingdom, basically ruin the kingdom of Israel. Who knows what, what destruction could have befallen Israel if, if David had been overthrown by his son. And he was basically in a position in 2 Samuel 19 where he was mourning and crying and crying over his son. And he's scolded by Joab, who's the head of the Israeli army. Um, he's scolded. He's being, saying, look, you know, your troops have won a great victory. They've defeated Absalom. And now the kingdom has a chance to go, to move forward along the righteous path. And here you are, weeping over this rebellious and worthless son who tried to destroy you and basically tried to usurp your throne. I mean, Absalom is, was a hot-headed rebel. Um, you know, now all of this was a consequence of David's sin, his rebellion, um, Absalom's rebellion. There were great consequences for David's sin by es essentially committing adultery with Bathsheba and uh, murdering her husband Uriah. Nevertheless, it doesn't excuse his rebellion. And David was preoccupied with his son when he should have been congratulating his troops and, and praising his troops for basically saving not only David and his family, but saving Israel from this from this reprobate and, and from this rebel. Um, I mean, basically, Absalom murdered Amnon for incest with Tamar. You know, he, he was now, should have uh, Absalom, should Amnon have been punished for raping his sister? I mean, there's incest. It's disgusting. Of course he should have been. Should he have murdered him? No. You know, he should have come to justice. He should have been in prison, but murdered and, and cold, murdered and, and, and out of control anger. I mean, Absalom was, was out of control, was a worthless son. So I'm going to quickly read that uh, scripture from 2 Samuel 19 here. If I can find it. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to read it. Um, then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. As he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And, jo and Joab, this is the head of the Israeli army, was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it, 
said that day, the king is grieved for his son. Let's say, let's see. So I'm going to go down a few verses. This is 2 Samuel 19.5. Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants, who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Okay, so Joab understood. Joab's heart was right, at least in that situation. Now that Joab was far from pure, you know, it, he was far from pure. I mean, all of sin and all fall short of God's glory. But in this instance, he's right. You know, you have grieved for your enemies. And what does he say here? Let's see. You love your enemies and hate your friends. Basically, you know, David had his army that defeated Absalom's arm, army, prevented this usurpation of his kingship, which ultimately probably would have led to the destruction of Israel. And David should be seeing that. You know, he should be seeing the truth, and he should be rejoicing in that great victory, and basically uh, his rebellious son being defeated. And here he is crying over crying over it. You know, he's, his heart is deceiving him. He has serious emotional error. He is not seeing what's right and what is true, because his own heart is deceiving him because his family ties are too strong. He's not thinking about God first. He's thinking about his emotional tie to Absalom first. So that's another way the heart deceives, through family ties. So what is the, what is the antidote to all this? What is the antidote to emotional error? Well, the antidote to emotional error is to be in God's Word and to be in God's truth because our emotions, because the original fall in the Garden of Eden, our emotions are not aligned with the truth. And the truth is the Word of God. And, and Jeremiah understood this. So I'm going to go back to Jeremiah again. What I, you know, Jeremiah uh, 17, 9, the verse I started with. Well, I'm going to go back to Jeremiah now to get his understanding because he clearly understood the deceiving nature of the heart. What did he say here? Jeremiah 10, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. <clears throat> okay, so he understood. I don't know what the right way is. If I follow my heart, if I just do whatever feels right, you know, then I'm not going to be able to direct my own steps. It is not in man to direct his own steps. So he understood the fallen nature of the human heart, obviously, and he understood that it couldn't direct man properly in the way that he should go. Um, let's see what else we can hear about uh, trusting in your own feelings, so to speak. Um, Proverbs 28. Whoever trusts, trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Proverbs 28, 26. Okay, here's another one. The way of a fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 12, 15. Okay, he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. The way of a fool seems right in his own eyes, right? Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Okay, so scripture is saying flat out, it's foolish to trust in your own emotions. Your own emotions will not direct you properly, and they're fallen. And if you trust in your own emotions, it's, it's foolish. And the fool is wise in his own eyes. Okay, this is a person who follows their emotions. I'm just going to do what I feel like doing because it feels right. You know, I'm really angry with this person because they insulted me, so I'm going to get into a brutal fist fight with them and in a public place because that's what I feel like doing. You know, no, that's, that's, that's totally wrong. What are you supposed to do in that situation? You turn the other cheek. Okay? Now, the way that you get your emotions aligned with the truth is by being in God's Word. Um, your, your emotions need to be guided by God's Word. That will align them with the proper response. And, and Scripture is replete with examples of what happens when people express their emotions properly in ways that are aligned with God's truth. 
Okay, so if we say, look at Proverbs 9.10, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Okay? So if you fear God, you will get knowledge of God through His Word. Then you will have the insight. Then you will know, oh, okay, I should be angry with this. I should be angry with that. I should love this. I should hate that. I should be sad over this. I should not be sad over that. In other words, your emotions will be aligned with the truth, and you will know what is right. Um, Psalm 97.10, you who love the Lord hate evil. Well, what is evil? Anything that rebels against God. Okay, well, what rebels against God? Go to Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. You know, just think about that. Keep it simple, right? You'll have no other gods before me. Don't worship idols. Um, you know, think about the most obvious examples in the Ten Commandments. What are they? Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't murder, right? So if you hear about somebody murdering somebody and you get angry and, and very, very upset about that and you want justice to come to that person for that murder, okay, that's the correct type of anger. Or if you're, you hear about somebody committing adultery um, and ruining somebody's household, especially if they have kids, so the kids are learning that wrong is right and you're furious and you're upset over that, that's the correct type of anger. On the other hand, if you're walking down the street and somebody swears at you and you want to rage out against that person and punch them in the face, okay, that's the wrong type of anger. What does Jesus say? Turn the other cheek. That's where you turn the other cheek, okay? That's an insult to your pride. You know, that's where you don't get all angry and you don't get upset, okay? Um, so, for example, say, I mean... You can go on and on. Second Thessalonians 3, if a man doesn't work, a man doesn't eat. So, for example, let's say a father is angry with a deadbeat son because that son refuses to work. Okay, that's the right type of anger. Okay, that father getting angry with that kid because they refuse to work, that's the right type of anger because Scripture says if a man doesn't work, a man doesn't eat. You know, if, you don't, if you're unwilling to work, you shouldn't even live. That's what Scripture says. So if a father gets angry with the son over that situation, that's the correct type of anger. On the other hand, if a father gets angry with the son because the son achieves more prestige and more status and more wealth in his life than he did, okay, that's the wrong type of anger. That's jealousy and that's pride. Okay, that's an example of emotional error. Um, Matthew 23, for example, when Jesus uh, laments over Jerusalem, he, he cries and weeps over Jerusalem because he basically says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers its chicks. You know, you who killed the prophets and killed the messengers, you know, I would have gathered you, but you refuse. You know, basically they refuse correction. They refuse obedience to God. And Jesus cries over that because he knows so many in Jerusalem in his time were going to hell because of their rebellion against God and because of their sin. And Jesus cried over that. Okay, that's the correct kind of sadness. You should cry over something like that. You know, you shouldn't cry, for example, because uh, you sent a text message to somebody and they didn't get back to you uh, in ten minutes, so you get all upset and sad and, and you start crying over that. I mean, that's, that's stupidity and that relates to pride. Emotional error. You know, you should be angry, you should feel love, you should feel hate, you should feel sadness, but over the correct things. And the only way to know what those correct things are is to be saved and be in the Word of God so your emotions can be aligned with the truth and not just your own fallen heart. Because, as Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is a deceiver. Uh, the heart is a deceiver. So how do you stay away from that emotional error? Through the Word of God through being saved, through having knowledge of His Word and being aligned with the truth, and that will ha allow you to express your emotions correctly. I mean, think about anger, for example. Does that mean you should never get angry? No, you should, but you should get angry over right and wrong, right? And it should never turn into a grudge. You know, it says, Paul says in Ephesians, you know, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and allow the devil to get a foothold. In other words, like I said, if you're angry with somebody for committing murder, that is correct. But at the same time, you have to let the anger go. You never turn it into a grudge. And so many people let their anger, even if their anger is expressed correctly, they hang on to it and they let it turn into a grudge, which is part of the deceitfulness of the heart, of the fallen heart, and that leads to emotional error.
So anyway, enough said. I want to end with a, a gospel message here, uh, which says, All have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. Romans 3.23, Romans 3.10, There is not one righteous, not one. There is not one who understands or seeks after God. Um, we're all guilty of sin. We're all guilty of rebellion against God. It is something we inherited from Adam and Eve. Uh, rebellion is in our nature, and the only way, ultimately, to be pardoned by God for that rebellion is to find atonement in the man who knew no sin. And the man who knew no sin is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us. So in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when Jesus punished, or when God punished his son Christ on the cross, he made him pay for the sins of all of believing humanity. And that satisfies God's anger. That satisfies God's wrath. It gives us peace with God. Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus is referred to the, as the Prince of Peace. He creates peace between man and God. And by confessing Christ as Lord, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. So it's a matter of confessing Christ as Lord, and you basically put yourself under his guidance for your life and your eternity. And in so doing, you receive full pardon from God, and you are accepted by God as righteous because his son, his perfect son, who knew no sin, paid the death penalty in full, paid, it, paid the wages of sin with his own death, and you are seen as righteous by God. So thank you for listening. This has been Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is an entire Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. You can see this sermon at more uh, through the website. It's getbibletruth.com. And I hope this has been a chance for believers to get built up and edified. And I hope it gives unbelievers a chance to confess Christ as Lord. And I say thank you for listening. My, my name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.